Look to the dial, listen up, this 80s crew. Come on, come on, feel the vibe. We're putting in something new. We got movie on the mind, but bring it to the phone. We got movies on the mind, stories to unfold. And good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. This is Harrison Smith back with another episode of Cinema for the time being. And uh, glad to be back for a little bit here. And I'm going to jump right into things. Uh, The Daily Jaws, which is a great social media account, uh, might be the most definitive Jaws social media account that is out there. And its dedication is just phenomenal to the film and, and keeping the film alive, not that really, I guess, needs all of that, but there's always something cool on the Daily Jaws. Well, anyway, for whatever reason, uh, I've been doing some research also for a book on lost versions of movies, and I came across some material from Richard Matheson uh, and his plan for Jaws 3. Uh, the, The great legendary writer was brought in to do a draft of Jaws 3, that will eventually become Jaws 3D and all that nonsense. But before that, Matheson's original idea was something akin to the Matawan shark attacks back in 1917. And he wanted to update that. And he brought the story up to the modern day. Basically, uh, a shark, I, I don't know if it was, it probably is a great white, but great whites again, if you want to get all sciencey here, really can't survive in brackish or fresh water. But anyway, a shark goes upstream, similar to the Matawan attacks, starts terrorizing a small community where it gets trapped in in a large lake, you know, gigantic oversized pond kind of thing, where the community has to unite and kill it. So it's it's pretty much Jaws in, in a pond kind of thing is what it sounded like. Well, anyway, the point is I used AI just to tool around. And I'm exploring AI and I'm going to get into it because that's the whole point of this episode today. I used AI uh, to render what I envisioned were some possible scenes from Matheson's ideas. Uh, Again, there are no storyboards or any type of photography or stills or anything that exists of this. So I just kind of imagined something. And then I went a step further and I animated uh, some of those images. And I posted one just for fun. That's all I did. And I posted it up and I tagged the Daily Jaws uh, thinking, you know, hey, th- this might be interesting. Well, 30,000 likes and how many thousand retweets later, it got a lot of attention. Uh, the problem is a lot of it was negative and a lot of people instantly, whether attacking me personally or just AI in general coming out of the gate swinging. And one of them in particular was a college film student. Uh, I'm not going to name uh, the account or anything like that. A lot of the criticism that came back is not wrong. So I'm going to admit that right from the start, because really what it comes down to is, you know, what what is AI? Is AI truly art or is it just really thieving and borrowing and taking away uh, from, you know, other artists and and actors and crew and, and everything else? And is it going to displace jobs? And I'm going to get into all of that because the question for this episode today is, is AI cinema. So again, cinema defined is the ability to make something great and consciously choosing not to. That's the whole point of cinema. It's hard to define. There is a huge gray area here. Let's go into where the criticism is founded. Last year, when the actor and writer strikes went on, uh, I wrote a 19-page letter to SAG and the WGA. And I warned and I said this was supposed to hopefully go out to the trades. I tagged every major trade, Variety, Deadline, Hollywood Reporter, Newsweek, Rolling Stone. I Pretty much all the big ones I tagged, not a single one of them picked this up. And SAG, no response whatsoever. And I said to them that this strike is more than just about residuals. And it's more than just about AI is going to take jobs. I equated this with the Alamo. The walls are surrounded and the enemy is going to come over those walls. You may hold them off for a week. You might hold them off for two weeks, but they're coming over the walls and they're going to win. And that's AI. Unless the studios came no less 
to holding a summit meeting between the five families, so to speak, but the heads of those studios to come together and craft with SAG and with all of the guilds a bill of rights, an AI technology bill of rights, nothing was going to happen. You might get a few scraps from the table. The writers might get a few more residuals. The actors might get something. And look, their gripes are founded. I get it. These studios are making billions and they're throwing nothing to the artists, the actors, the writers. And here's the whole point. I'm one of them. I'm in the industry. I am an indie filmmaker fighting every goddamn day for any penny that I can get to make a motion picture. And some of these executives, like over at Warner Brothers, are, are shelving multi-million dollar projects while pocketing hundreds of millions of dollars in bonuses and salaries and perks and everything else and just running studios into the ground. And we don't even have to get into what Kathleen Kennedy has done with Lucasfilm over at Disney and the whole lot. That Those can be five different episodes. But the point being is, is that I am one of those people out there. And that's also going to go where I'm going to support AI as well too. Because as I alluded in my advertising for this episode, this just might be my villain origin story. So I wrote this letter to SAG and said, you need to call this to attention. And most of all, craft a strict bill of rights with the tech companies, the developers of this uh, technology, because it's not software. It is a technology. And you need to come together and actually agree on how it will be used and deployed to not displace, at least not massively up front, and with, with mass layoffs and mass firings, you need to figure out a way that we can integrate this technology either gradually or morally, I guess might be the best way to do it. No one did anything. And before you think I'm crazy, let's go back to the 1980s. I did a previous podcast on some of this. Actually, let's go back to the late 1970s. And that's when VCRs were finally catching on. Now, we've had videotapes since really the late 1940s, early 1950s. But we didn't have consumer home recording devices until arguably the mid-70s, somewhere there. And I'm not going to go into the whole beta VHS nonsense. That, that's not what this is about. The point is, is once studios saw what they were missing... They did massive dumps of their libraries and content. They didn't even think there probably are some movies we should never release to video cassette. There are probably some films that are so culturally relevant, we should probably keep them for a while under wraps and release them every so many years to the public to keep them not only culturally relevant, but to help bind us culturally and artistically. And you can pick the film of your choice where you think that or what you think that might be. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got films like Gone with the Wind, Star Wars, Jaws. Uh, we, we can go on forever and you can add to your list. But the point is, nobody did that. The executives saw fast cash. And if you remember, if you're old enough to remember, these titles started dumping out like crazy. And they were dumped out with shitty covers for artwork. They were dumped with really bad video transfers, grainy, washed out, pan and scan, cropped, really terrible video transfers. And only by the mid 80s did Letterbox come around with the advent of also new wider screen televisions that studios started to realize uh, we probably should be taking better care of the shit that we're putting out there. But they also saw the opportunity to now re-release everything again, now in wide letterbox format. See the film as you were meant to see it, the whole thing. And again, I can get into so much detail about this, but the point is all the studios did it. They dumped all their stuff and they did it for the quick cash grab. And they're going to do it again with AI. They're going to turn around. They are forming AI studios. James Cameron is leading the way. And that is a very scary thing because his whole world of the Terminator that he warned us about, he's helping to shape. 
all of this is starting to happen. And I predicted last summer that studios will cease to be artistic film studios and they will gradually turn into technology studios, high tech, big tech studios. And Paramount has announced that's exactly pretty much the way that it is going. All the other studios will follow suit and they all want to deploy AI because here's why. With AI, your actors never get old. They don't sexually harass other actors. There are no legal lawsuits. There are no, there's nothing like that. There are no benefits to pay, no royalties to pay. And if you do have to pay out to an actor that you're using their image, the fees that you're paying to their estate to license their image are far less than five, six points on the back end. So studios are looking for this magic algorithm. They want to generate scripts by AI. They want to create everything with AI. And if you don't believe that this is coming, you are a dinosaur stuck in the fucking tar pit because it is coming. All you have to do is look at, by now, by standards, the old video of what Sora can do. And there is one shot where Sora is has created an aerial drone view of an 1840s mining town in California. It looks absolutely real. All those carpentry jobs are gone, electrician jobs, landscapers, wardrobe designers, special effects, camera operators, crew, lighting, gaff, everything, it's gone. And you don't have to like it, and I certainly don't like it, but this is the way it is. Other than the Alamo, I will equate this to a tsunami and the water has already pulled away from the beach and you've noticed it and you're looking around on this wet beach going, where did all the water go? And then you turn and you look out toward the ocean, that giant wave is coming in. Now you can stand there and watch it come in. You can run for the hills and probably get away. You can flee the situation or you might want to try to grab a boat and try to surf this thing. If you just stand there and watch it coming in or pretend it's not happening, turn your back to it. It's going to crush you and it's going to drown you. And that is my metaphor for AI. It is a tsunami that is rushing in. And this technologically is advancing, not in years. It's you we used to say, oh, you just wait in a couple years. We are talking just wait in a couple weeks. Things have changed considerably in just a couple weeks. So Harrison, are you for AI? I'm just saying it's here and it's not going anywhere. So I guess I have to not only understand it, which I am, I'm already pretty proficient in stable diffusion and flux. Comfy UI uses flux and most of all, I'm animating my images and I'm getting really good at it and I'm learning special effects. I'm learning how to create backgrounds. I'm learning how to create animated figures that can speak and talk by lip sync. I'm learning all of this because I'm grabbing the boat and I'm going to try to surf it. Let's go to why AI is going to be the alternative, especially for independent filmmakers. I have a script. Uh, it's not your traditional horror script. And I've shopped it to a number of distributors to see if I can even get an MG up front. And they start asking the same questions. Well, does this happen at the end? No. Well, does this happen? No, not really. So I'm not Ryan Johnson trying to subvert your expectations here. But what I'm trying to say is, is I have something a little original and it doesn't follow the formula format, which is dangerous these days. All you have to do is look at the three new Halloween movies and look at what's coming out there and seeing that everything is formula, 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 whether it's Marvel, it doesn't matter. It's all about formula and predictive. Hell, I could probably shoot this for $175,000, $200,000, but here's the thing. I have bills to pay. I have lights to keep on. I have a family. How am I going to make money off of a $175,000 film? Let's really look at one of those micro budgets that the idealistic filmmakers, especially in college, think that, oh, this is just great. Let me tell you where this fucking goes. So let's just say you need a celebrity for your movie. That's going to make your little indie film a SAG production. So you're going to pay 
SAG wages to your celebrity. I know you're going, but that's a guild. That's what they're for. They're there to protect. Let me tell you how SAG protects actors. So when I was shooting Zombie Killers and it was a SAG production, they just started a new rule that every extra, no matter if they were just your friend and they just wanted a cameo and they would work gladly for free for you to help you keep your budget down, so maybe that wage could go to feeding your people instead of paying a wage. Now, if they say just two lines of dialogue, it might be one line now, but if they have at least two lines of dialogue, you must pay your non-union, non-guild member actor SAG wages. And when I was told this, I asked my SAG rep, so you mean, let me just go through this here. You have a club. They're like, yeah, SAG's the club. Right. You have a club. My people are not members. Right. Yes. But they have to pay your dues. Well, basically, yes. And I told the woman on the phone, I said, you know what? You are trying to extort me with my own budget. I believe there is a concerted effort by SAG and other guilds to choke out independent filmmakers because we're really just a pain in their ass. We're not making the big money to pay the big fees and the wages and the pension and health and all of that stuff that comes with it. We're annoying paperwork for them. We're not really a big payoff for SAG. And most of the time, we're not even worth their time. And before you think that's not true for you indie filmmakers right now, how long did you have to fucking wait to get your security deposits back that you had to place or your contingency fees that you had to put into SAG? They want them right away. You can't can't shoot. They won't green light your picture until you wire those goddamn funds. How long did it take for you to get those funds back? And by the way, my SAG big celebrity names, I paid in advance. Their money was escrowed privately. So they were paid. So it's not like SAG is looking out for them to say, well, we got to hold that money in case, you know, you run out of money or you screw our actors. No, nobody got screwed on my sets. We took their money and put them with proof into verifiable escrow accounts where those actors knew that money was placed and they're getting paid. I still had to send deposits on those actors to SAG. And that means money from my budget on top of what I've already paid my actor. So I've got to take a percentage of their salary still and send it to hold to SAG for no goddamn reason other for them to hold it so they can say, see actors, see what we're doing for you. And for those of you who make indie films, and for those of you who don't, you're going to understand a little bit now why artists are turning to AI. What, what option do we have? That means our money is taken away from us. That was money for hotel lodging. That was money for crew paying. That was money for overtime. That was money for any kind of effect screw-ups to, to pay for things, to feed people, all of that. And SAG is taking it. And they're holding it for no reason whatsoever other than just to hold it. So for you indie filmmakers, again, I ask, how long does it take for them to get that deposit back to you? It can take over a year. And by that time, that's no good. So when you're jonesing for an extra $10,000 for your score, because let's say your composer took a shit on you and crapped out and you need a new score, but you need $10,000 for a new score and you don't have it, but SAG is holding it. And they won't release it until they damn well feel. And you can email them and call them and leave messages. It doesn't matter. They'll return it when they want to. But boy, when they want their money up front, that's when they take it. I have actors all the time, and you indie filmmakers know this, that will say, don't make me join SAG. I don't want to join SAG. Don't taft Hartley me. I don't want to join SAG just yet because they know we lose work. I have been pushed for a long time. Join the DGA. Join the PGA. Join the WGA. I have not. Because I've been told by certain productions I've been hired on as a gun-for-hire director or a gun-for-hire writer, if I were WGA, they wouldn't have hired me because of all the fees that go with it. And look, I get it. Guilds were created, labor unions were created to protect workers because 
People are fuckers. They will fuck you. And workers have been exploited and fucked. I totally, 100% get it. But now we've reached a point also where a lot of these unions are now stifling the smaller guy. They're stifling the people that they were originally created to protect. They are aligned with the big studios. So what did SAG do to protect their actors during this strike? What did they do? Fran Drescher, what did you do? Where is this AI Bill of Rights? Where was this studio summit meeting? They didn't do anything because it's coming. And these studios are quietly developing. We already found out. I said when uh, What's-His-Face uh, told everybody last year from Disney uh, that basically uh, Bob Iger, uh, when Iger told uh, actors last year, go ahead and strike. And when you start losing your apartments, you'll be back. That's a fuckwad attitude. And the reason why is I said right out, they have an ace up their sleeve. And son of a bitch, if I wasn't right, I found out that the developers of Sora, OpenAI Sora, had already been meeting with Disney before that strike. They know what's coming. And before you think, oh no, Harrison, people will always want to see real people acting. Really? Have you watched a Marvel movie? Did you watch The Flash? It was all CGI and AI. And really, Marvel movies, Stranger Things, they're in front of a fucking green screen all the time. They're on a green screen set for a quarter of the time. During season four of Stranger Things, we watched Millie Bobby Brown's deep fake AI through most of the season. Don't give me this bullshit that it's going to be all about real people and real people in real film. Really? How many people out there, other than Christopher Nolan, who can afford it, are shooting on 35 millimeter film? This is the equivalent of vinyl is going to make a comeback. Okay, if you want to go into FYE or some boutique store and pick up a classic album just to have it displayed on your shelf so you look hip and cool, or you know, use your retro turntable to play it on, fine. But don't tell me that fucking vinyl is coming back the way that it was in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and early 80s. No, it's not. It's not coming back. The same way CDs aren't coming back. The same way DVDs are not coming back. And I'm not against hard media, physical media. I'm all for it because it should never go away because then the censors are going to get it and they're already doing it. They're changing shit. So I am all about physical media. I don't want these things to go away. But if you're going to try to tell me with a straight face that the VHS cassette and VCR are going to come back, you're full of shit. It's not coming back. You can't go back. And that's what I'm trying to say. This technology is the tsunami. So let me go back now to this film I've been shopping. So I'm trying to get even a $75,000 MG for this. I've even thought about crowdfunding this to shoot this with a crew on red cams with a decent sound person, with a decent cameraman, DP, the whole thing. I'm trying to do it right. And nobody will give me the money for it because why? It doesn't fit the formula parameters and it's not a bloody ending and it's not a gory ending and the one character doesn't turn into a demon-possessed zombie or anything like that. So what do I do? I really want to make this movie. Now I can crowdfund it, but we all know how well crowdfunders go. If you're not Rob Zombie, and even he had trouble with 31, but if you're not Zach Braff, I guess, or you're not James Franco, exactly how are you making money off these crowdfunders? Because that's another myth, like the paranormal activity myth, and that is, I made a movie for $15,000 and it's going to make $450 million. No, it's not. Not without a massive marketing campaign like Paranormal Activity had. And that's the same thing here with crowdfunders. If you don't do it right, and a good crowdfunder is basically a full-time job every day. And you've got to make promises to people, and you've got to deliver on those promises, and you've got to answer back to people, and you've got to create uh, business plans and packages and display plans. And all, oh my God, I don't have the time for that. So I've been taking this around to some of the distributors I've worked with. They want to work with me. They just don't want to work with this film. I thought of turning to AI. The technology is there. It is there now where it can be done. And most of all, 
James Cameron thinks the same thing and you don't have to like it and I don't like it. So for that college filmmaker out there that ranted on about how this is theft and everything like that, well, you may be right, but it's happening. And as a filmmaker in college, you better be getting on the tsunami in a boat and learning how to commandeer this. Because if you don't, you're crushed. You may not have a film career by the time you leave. I'll give you an example. Uh, I have a neighbor whose grandson is a senior. He just graduated and he just headed off this fall to film school. He wants to be a cinematographer. And he knew nothing about AI, nothing. And this is something interesting. I have found in my personal experience, most people under Gen X know nothing about AI or very little, and they don't want to know much about it. That's dangerous. I know more than most Gen Zers about AI and its power. Most Gen Zers and younger don't want to know about it. I suspect this film student that came at me on Twitter is a Gen Zer. And they have no clue as to what is coming. So for me, I tried to tell this kid when he came over, I said, well, do you know about this? No, you better look into this. And I gave him tutorials and I gave him videos. And I said, you better be looking because you're planning on graduating film school in four years to be a cinematographer. You may not have a career, not even that you may not find a job. You may not have a career. By the time you graduate, you may have a totally useless degree. All the stuff you've learned about camera work and everything may not even matter. And I know you're thinking, I'm way off here. The sky is falling. Every single thing I've predicted on this has come to pass. I haven't been wrong yet. And I said 25 years ago, I said to some people right out in a group, I was giving a talk. That if I were a celebrity in Hollywood right now, and we're talking back in the 90s, I would be copywriting and licensing my image, especially the estate of Sean Connery, Roger Moore, uh, anybody who's playing James Bond. Because one day you're going to be able to watch all the old James Bond movies and you're going to be able to watch them with the Bond of your choice. So if you want Roger Moore in Casino Royale or Skyfall, You'll be able to do that. If you want Sean Connery in A View to a Kill, you can do that. And it's happening. We already saw what they could do. And that was even a little crude with Rogue One and Peter Cushing. And I'm not getting even into the legalities of all this with family estates and licensing images. Those are just speed bumps. They'll get worked out. The problem is, is that the law is way behind on the technology. Legally, people don't know what the fuck to do. To give you an example, school districts right now have no idea legally what they even can do when they see issues such as deep fake porn coming out against students where other kids are learning this technology and they're dropping other people into porn films, uh, others doing pornographic acts. They're doing this kind of thing and school districts don't know how to react to it. I have talked to several school solicitors that said they don't even know where this falls on the legal spectrum. Is it technically underage child pornography if it isn't real? They don't know. And the reason why they don't know is because they don't know if they can hold any charges against someone and hold someone accountable in court. Teachers don't know what to do when they found that deep fakes have been made about them on TikTok accounts. One principal got nailed falsely for being racist and saying racist things because the athletic director in a school district didn't like the principal and took some sampling of the principal's voice and turned it into a fake AI racist rant. Now you think, yeah, but they proved it was AI. Yeah, but the fucking damage was done up front to that principal's career and their reputation. The, the media is quick to go out there and destroy you in the media. They're very slow and never on the same scope are they to come back and retract anything to repair that image and the damage done. They're always there to blow it up. They're never there to put it back together, even if it was a 100% mistake. The law doesn't even know what to do here. Legally, what can you do? 
with AI. You can't really stop it from being deployed. Well, it's artistic theft. All right, prove it. Go to court and prove it. Shut down an AI production and prove that one pixel inside this gigantic video was borrowed from another film and find that tiny molecular cellular level piece and identify it. What is this Blade Runner where it has like an identification code number on the DNA strand? Is that what you're going to do? Because ask any good lawyer, they don't know what to do. They have no idea to prove copyright infringement. Well, it's stealing from the artist. I guess in theory, yes, prove it. Prove how a figure that you've created fictionally, a, a beautiful person, a, a male, female, doesn't matter, a character, prove that that's somebody's image that has been stolen. There might be a piece of somebody, well, there is, there is a piece of somebody's image out there, but that's like saying, you know, you took a scraping of someone's fingernail and put that into the makeup of a new human being. And I know you're thinking, Harrison, you're an asshole. You, you're, you're ruining all of this. You're, you're going against everything. Yeah, this is my villain origin story because the studios, the giant studios are creating a culture where smaller independent filmmakers like myself and others are fighting for the very last scraps at the table. When you start hearing that a film like Smile is a small independent film, we have a problem. Because it is, I guess, a small independent film when you look at the fact that, I don't know, Todd Phillips' Joker was $200 million for his own fuck you project to his fans. $200 million. Yeah, I guess $18, $19 million is small budget. What does that mean for the real independent filmmakers? All that means is that our budget levels keep heading toward the basement. We keep going down. Some of you years ago were probably making movies before the pandemic and low budget was five, six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand. Now you're down to 250. Make it for 250 and give, give me a celebrity. We need a name to shop it around. So then you take that 250 and you give the celebrity between SAG and everything else and their fees and their agent fees, probably 50 to $65,000 of that 250 goes toward just one name. And the rest, you get to go make your movie with that. That means you get to go feed your crew. So you're going to hire less crew. You're not going to hire a full crew. You're not going to hire a full staff. You're going to get the cheapest DP you can. You're probably going to do the post on your own. What, what upside is there to this? And don't give me this artistic bullshit, but at least you get to artistically render your dream. Do you really? I wanted to do so much more with where the scary things are. That script had so much more to it. But that budget did not allow me to come even close to realizing the dream that I had for that film. And you know what? I'm fucking tired of making movies where I'm compromising everything. And my films have all been compromised by budget. All of them. And I'm tired of it because most of the money on my films have gone towards celebrity talent. I watched on one film of mine where the investor who was just so celebrity struck gave the lead celebrity a $25,000 bonus on top of their fee. And I stood there and watched that check get written. And I thought, I wrote this thing. I found all the locations. I put all the crew together. I cast this thing by myself. I negotiated all of the contracts for the celebrities and this person's getting the $25,000 raise. But here's the other thing before you think, oh, Harrison's just sour grapes. You just wanted that bonus. Yeah, fuck yeah, I wanted that bonus. However, how about you took that $25,000 and put it towards some more effects? How about you took that $25,000 and I could feed my crew a little better? How about that? Maybe I could have used you know, an extra electrician or grip. I could have used something like that for $25,000, but you put it in the pocket of one person because you were celebrity smitten. No, independent filmmakers are getting a little tired of this. And with AI, you can take control. It doesn't mean that it's right. I am not defending it 100%, but we've been backed into a corner. We're the Joker. We're Jack Napier. We've been dropped into the acid, but we've turned bad. Some of us are turning bad 
because we've been forced into it because we can't afford to make the films that we wanted to with proper crews and proper cameras and regular technology and equipment. So people are going to turn to this. I promise you it's already happening and it's already crossed my mind. So that little shark video that I created that I put up on the daily jaws that garnered over 30,000 views to date. You can look at it now. It's probably up to 40,000 who knows, but boy, did the hate come in. Oh, AI is for hacks. AI is for, you know, losers. AI is for uh, artistically bankrupt people. Okay. You can say that all you want, but you know what? They said the same fucking thing about CGI and green screen. They said the same thing about photography when there were painters. They said the same thing about when cars came along to displace the horse. I don't know what to tell you. You can be angry and probably a lot of your anger is justified. And I'm with you. I don't want to see things turn to AI. I want to be on a film set. I want to employ people. I want to put money in people's pockets. That's all I want to do. But it's becoming goddamn harder and harder to do this. And the studios are deliberately doing it because this is the way they want to see it go. Look at the way things are going. And again, before you think we want real actors, just go look at Stranger Things. Go look at any Marvel movie. Really? That's Mark Ruffalo up on the screen as the Hulk? Oh, when Harrison Ford turns into Red Hulk that all the fans were getting boners about? Really? That's a makeup effects artist doing that work? That's AI. And you can disguise it and still use the word CGI. But let me put it to you this way. There is a famous photo of George Lucas back, I think, in 1983, standing in a giant warehouse with all his models, all his creatures, costumes, all the things, all the magic that was used to make his Star Wars films. And it says something like 1983. It might even say 1985. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's the 80s. And then they show one of him in 2005. And all it is is an older Lucas standing in front of a green screen. Where's your outrage there? Where most of those new Star Wars prequels, yeah, everybody's talking now, oh, the prequels. Now, do you hate the prequels? Yeah, I fucking hate the prequels. The prequels were terrible. No, Disney Star Wars did not rehab the prequels because most of it was walk and talk on green screen. And that stupid lava fight that all you dumb Star Wars boners get because, you know, you're just like, oh my God, that lava fight was incredible at the end. No, it was stupid and it was way over long and it was indulgent and it didn't need to be. We could have had a really decent physical, practical fight between Anakin and Obi-Wan. Instead, you got this giant green screen showdown that went on way too long. No, people like you super fans have helped ruin it. So before you go starting to attack AI, you better start looking at yourselves because you helped to create this monster. You help create it by embracing all this ridiculous CGI and green screening and all this superhero nonsense that has taken really what used to be shot on regular video or film and is now all green screened and composited. I mean, look at Godzilla. Are you bitching about Godzilla? Godzilla just won the Oscar. 70 years old, Godzilla wins an Oscar for best special effects. I didn't hear any fucking outrage over the AI and the CGI used for Godzilla in Godzilla Minus One. No dude in a suit. What happened to all the model builders? What happened to the set builders? Oh, a lot of them were displaced by green screen, CGI, and AI. I don't hear any outrage about that. All I saw was celebration. Godzilla won the Oscar. Godzilla won the Oscar. Godzilla took 70 years to win an Oscar. An Oscar for what? There's a reason why they were able to pull those effects off for the budget that they had and make them look comparable to gigantic Hollywood MonsterVerse legendary effects. And that's with the help of AI. Yeah, this just might be my villain origin story. As the rest of us, and I know I want to hear from some of you other independent filmmakers out there, because I think you know what I'm talking about. And again, you don't have to agree with me because really, you critics of AI, I agree with you. I just don't know what else to do. And maybe I have become cinema, but I want to do the best job that I can. And I'm tired of making movies where I've 
cut five, 10 pages out of my script or reworked effect scenes because I just can't afford them. Now I can do whatever the hell I want. Now I can realize the vision that's on my script. I don't know what else to say. I don't want it to be this way. And for that college student that might be listening to this, you're right. I just don't know what else to do. I'm happy to entertain alternatives. And for any financial film investor that might be listening to this, I have over 14 films to my name, a solid track record of quality motion pictures that not only get made, but get released both domestic and foreign with good distributorship. Call me, email me, you can find me, but somehow I don't think I'm going to hear from anyone. In the meantime, the beat goes on. The Marvel movies crank, new Star Wars movies will be made, the green screen will be replaced by composite and generative fill, and eventually it will all be AI. This tsunami is on its way in. This is Harrison Smith. Thanks for listening to my rant. I hope to be back with another broadcast, and I look forward to hearing from you. Take care. Come on, come on, feel the vibe. We're bringing something new. The outmovie, all mine. We're bringing it soon.